Good morning for some and good afternoon to others. Welcome to the Prairies Regional Adaptation Collaborative's webinar. Today we're gonna to be highlighting climate change adaptation in Northern communities. My name is Beth Timmers. I'm a project manager at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and we act as the secretariat for the PRAC. The PRAC, just to give you some background, is a cost-shared program of the governments of all Prairie provinces. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and Natural Resources Canada. And altogether, the PRAC aims to increase the capacity of government and civil society decision makers all across the prairies. Our goal is to understand, prepare for, and take action to address the implications of our changing climate. So the webinar today is a part of a series of the PRAC that we host to highlight um, the adaptation efforts of municipalities and indigenous communities in prairie provinces. Our previous webinars have covered a range of topics, including how communities are planning for changing wildfire risk, which was our last webinar, and how conserving biodiversity can help to build climate resilience. So here's the slide for today's webinar. And today we're going to be focusing on the unique set of challenges that communities in the northern portion of, the, of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba are facing. We're also going to showcase what some of these communities are doing to address their climate risk. So you can see here our list of speakers today. We are so excited for this selection of speakers. Um, so excited to hear from them today. First, we have Dr. Deborah Davidson, who's a professor in the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Science, Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology from the University of Alberta. And she's also one of the few sociologists representing our region on the IPCC. Next, we have Justin Bork, who's the CEO of Willow Lake Métis Nation, who's going to be uh, sharing some of the really exciting adaptation work going on in the ground there. Lastly, we have Trevor Donald, who's going to be presenting the brand new climate change adaptation plan from the town of Churchill, and he is the climate change adaptation coordinator there. So thank you so much to all of our speakers today. There's going to be an opportunity to raise questions with the presenters following their presentations, um, which will be about half an hour in total. So please, as they're doing presentations, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and then we're going to get to as many of them as we can throughout the webinar. So to start things off, I would like to hand the webinar over to Dr. Davidson, who's going to give us an introduction to some of the unique challenges that communities in the northern parts of the Prairie Provinces are facing when they're planning for climate change. Over to you, Deborah. Sorry about that, I had my mute button on. Um, so I, thank you to IISD and, and Beth uh, Timmers uh, to, uh, for inviting me to participate in this conversation today. I, I, I think it's so important um, to, to be having these conversations. And, and I wanna start by uh, acknowledging that, that I'm uh, reaching out to you today from the city of Edmonton. Uh, and this, uh, this place on the map has historically been a place where uh, Indigenous peoples representing Diné, Cree, uh, Salto, Métis, and many other nations uh, had come to, to, to meet and share in um, not just goods, but, but also knowledge and information. And, and I'd like to carry on that tradition today um, and present myself as someone who's just here to share um, I, I don't present myself as someone who is an expert or, or an authority in any way in um, adaptation in, at the community level or, 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 or at, the, at, at higher levels. I think the real experts are people who are, are living on the ground and in those communities. And so I am very excited uh, for our Q&A session and really uh, hoping to, to hear uh, about your, your personal experiences in your own communities. Um, and I also want to uh, just uh, put out there that I, I know academics aren't supposed to express their, their feelings, um, but uh, I, I wanted to let you know that I'm one of many, many, many academics who are very worried, uh, very worried about the impacts of climate change on Canada and in other places around the world. And I'm particularly worried about uh, the North and, and Northern communities. So what I wanna do today, um, is talk to you just a, a little bit about 
uh, I guess, how academics have approached adaptation. Um, and I, I know that you all know what adaptation is, but just to make sure that we're on the same page and also just to, I guess, flag some, some, some themes, I think, that are important to, to just keep on the table or remain conscious of. Um, so I know that, that you've each uh, seen some variation of the definition of, of adaptation as a process of adjustment to actual or expected climate um, change and its effects. Um, and uh, that, that covers a lot of territory. So I think it's also important to break that down uh, a little bit and to clarify that uh, lots of uh, adaptation actions can be uh, proactive, taking them in advance, uh, and um, uh, or they can be reactive. So responses to, to changes that are sort of all, already um, unrolling. And adaptation can also be planned, coordinated. These are the steps that we want to take. But there's a lot of adaptation that happens autonomously, uh, just sort of um, inevitable shifts in complex systems that, including social systems that, that we experience after uh, major events. And also, I think, uh, importantly, and a lot of uh, climate scientists are, are increasingly drawing this distinction between incremental adaptation and transformative adaptation. Uh, incremental meaning, uh, you know, kind of taking things slowly, one step at a time, uh, maybe one system at a time, versus transformative, um, which, which represents kind of more of a full-scale uh, redo. Of, of, uh, of how we approach our, our organizations, how we approach our, our economies and so forth. And just in case uh, anyone takes my, uh, my little uh, image here seriously, I can assure you, I don't think that adaptation uh, is a game. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna give a very brief overview of the state of academic knowledge. Uh, and, and I'm gonna just highlight a, a handful of pieces because this is obviously a very large and, and, and growing area. Of, of research. And before I begin, I do want to note that I, I, un, I recognize that many of you, uh, if you're not linked to a university, you don't have access to scientific research papers, peer reviewed articles and, and, and so forth. And that's, you know, one of the things that, that I think I can do. I, I sometimes I feel like I, I'm, you know, I, I feel like I can't do enough uh, to help. But uh, if anybody on this call is interested in getting copies of any of the papers that I've drawing from uh, for, this, for this talk, uh, please just send me a note and I will access those papers for you and send, send them to you uh, by, by PDF. And hi, Deborah, okay. you can just go ahead and share your screen there so we can see. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I don't see how. Okay, let me just. Um, share screen. My apologies, I thought we were all set there. Okay, so fortunately we didn't cover much ground. I was right here. Um, so uh, just to, to move on, um, this is what I wanted to cover today um, before we start to, to zero in on, on our, 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 our Northern uh, Canadian uh, Northern Prairie situation. Um, one is I want to talk a little bit about the conceptual approaches that researchers have taken towards adaptation and, and um, adaptation planning and how they've shifted over time because I think there's important um, uh, issues there to flag. Um, and then I'm just going to very briefly uh, touch on uh, some of the most recent empirical studies that have been focused on local level adaptation efforts uh, to give you an idea of the types of activities that are undertaken and some of the co common challenges or barriers. And then after that, we'll move into uh, talking more about uh, Northern, Northern Prairie communities in particular. Okay, so in terms of how adaptation approaches have changed over time. Um, so I, I think that it's important to, 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 to talk about the approaches that we take to, to adaptation and adaptation planning because there's a lot of assumptions uh, uh, and worldviews that are embedded in the different kinds of approaches that we take. Uh, and if we don't talk about them, um, then, then those assumptions uh, and those worldviews basically aren't acknowledged and they aren't recognized. And uh, each, each uh, I guess, approach is gonna have its advantages and, and its trade-offs. 
So a lot of our earlier work focused on vulnerability and risk assessment. Um, vulnerability being uh, sort of defined as a, a combination of exposure and sensitivity and adaptive capacity. I don't want to go into a lot of detail about, about these definitions because I know you've all seen this before and, and um, we, we don't have a, a ton of time here. And then risk is uh, defined as the probability of an event like a flood or a, or a wildfire times the consequences of that event. Um, uh, so really handy tools uh, and, and um, you know, relatively easy to apply, but the, the, the limitations are that, that um, they tend to be limited to, to, to quantitative um, assessments and they're limited to things that we know and things that we can measure. And so if anything falls outside of those parameters then they tend not to get included in your assessment. So then we started uh, sort of moving into trying to adopt a new approach um, called resilience. And the addition of uh, what, what resilience adds, uh, added, I think, uh, most importantly, was an acknowledgement of uncertainty. So a recognition that, uh, you know, we need to start taking adaptation planning, um, uh, doing so now with, even if we don't know for sure, the degree to which we are vulnerable or the degree to which we are at risk. Um, so resilience, uh, a resilience approach focuses uh, more specifically on just building. Uh, building um, uh, buffering capacity and flexibility into, into our systems. Some of the critiques uh, that have been pitched towards resilience approaches is they're, they're pretty inward gazing. So you're only looking at your, uh, you know, your own community organizations and not really acknowledging the degree to which they're connected and related uh, to a broader social and political and economic context and also that you're dependent upon uh, you know, lots of organizations outside of, of, of that, uh, that geographic range. And they also tended to be pretty top down and, uh, you know, kind of focused on, uh, you know, technological solutions. And most recently, there, there's been uh, a lot of it, uh, growing attention towards um, what, what are, I'll call intersectionality approaches. And intersectionality approaches, um, bring much more attention to sort of the social and the political context in which we're trying to engage in adaptation planning and sort of confronting those challenges head on and trying to figure out how to navigate them rather than just ignoring them. Uh, and they pay a lot more attention to uh, equity and justice and the importance of uh, equity and justice, um, both uh, in, in sort of um, so barriers or challenges uh, to vulnerability pardon me, uh, to, to adaptation planning, um, but also places to, to target where, where community building can have a, have, have a big payoff. Uh, and then thirdly, I think intersectionality approaches um, uh, really embrace uh, respect for multiple knowledges and you know, recognizes that there, there are you know, way, way beyond voices in, in the academy, um, knowledges, uh, knowledge holders out there that, that are bringing something very critical to adaptation planning. So just uh, to move on then and, and take a look at um, the most common activities that tend to be undertaken around the world. Um, before we, we delve into this too far, I wanna, I wanna add the ca caveat that in, in sort of the, the broad kind of academic literature on adaptation, particularly empirical studies, a lot of the work is focused on the global south, and a lot of the work is focused on cities. So there's not a ton of empirical work that's, that's focused exactly on where we need it, uh, looking at communities like in, 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 in the Northern Prairie. So, uh, so a lot of this research represents contexts that, that don't uh, look exactly like ours. So I just wanna, wanna add that caveat in there. Um, but these are the kinds of uh, activities that tend to be undertaken. There's a lot of uh, work in sort of focusing on uh, building up natural buffers by changing natural resource management strategies, let's say uh, changing forest management strategies to, to address wildfire risk, for example, or focusing on uh, building nature-based solutions like um, building up uh, wetlands capacity um, and new agricultural techniques. So those are all kinds of varieties of different kinds of natural uh, buffer uh, strategies that have been been uh, applied, um, and then institu in in institution building efforts at new policies, uh, building new organizational units uh, within communities, 
and then staff training, all, all sort of oriented towards building capacity. These top two um, uh, groups are, are definitely the most common that, that, that seem to be uh, adapted by, by, uh, by communities uh, engaged in adaptation planning. Um, and then uh, the other types of activities include um, building com uh, capacity in your community. So trying to work on building more public knowledge and awareness, uh, providing safety nets for marginalized groups uh, and providing uh, financial supports uh, so that individuals and, and, and businesses can, uh, can, can build up their adaptive capacity in their, in their buildings or, um, or, or in their operations. And then of course, uh, in investing in, in emergency response as well. So um, within all of these uh, efforts at, at building adaptation planning, uh, there are a number of barriers that, uh, that have shown up. And, and it's, it's been kind of um, interesting because now that we have had enough, uh, I guess a, a larger and larger number of communities around the world that have started to make efforts at adaptation planning, we actually have data, we have, we have a means of assessing what these barriers are rather than just kind of speculating on what they might be. Uh, so the, the biggest, I guess, and most important basket of, of barriers are, are really socio-political ones. And this was kind of a surprise uh, just because the presumption before we actually had data was, was that the resource limit, so lack of information, uh, lack of financial resources and, and qualified staff and, and, and the, the presumption that would, was always that those would be the biggest barriers. But in, in the research um, that, uh, that we're starting to see so far is, uh, is that it's actually the, the socio-political pieces that, that are the biggest barriers. And number one within there is uh, uh, what's called cognitive uh, barriers. And so that includes everything from sort of uh, uh, perceptions of risk and, and uh, willingness to engage uh, in, in personal adaptation practices and things like that. So, so um, these are just kind of things to, to, to bear in mind uh, when, you know, for, for any community that, that, that's focused on or, or you know, are, are beginning to embark on community adaptation planning is, is to sort of, you know, flag some of these areas that, that might not be on your radar um, uh, to, to give attention. Okay, so moving into the prairies now. Um, again, I, I, I think I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but just some, some, some information that I think is important to just always be mindful of and, and to, to be reminded of is, is the unique position of uh, the Canadian North and, and, and Northern Prairies as well. So if you look at the graph at the left, um, and all of these, uh, by the way, came out of the last uh, changing, uh, Canada's Changing Climate Report. Um, if you look over at the left, you can see sort of the global average temperature increase that has been observed over the last uh, 60 years in the red line. Uh, Canada, not surprisingly, given that we're, you know, an, an, a northern climate, um, we've uh, experienced a, a sort of a, a, a much more, uh, um, a much steeper curve in our, in our increase in temperatures. And then uh, the further north you go, uh, the, the, the more extreme uh, those temperature shifts are going to be, and particularly in, in the interior. So you can look at the, 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 the image on the right there, uh, you can see that you know, the, the northern latitudes that are around the Hudson Bay, they have a bit of that moderating effect uh, of that large water body, but the interior prairies, uh, particularly in um, um, Saskatchewan and, and um, in Alberta, uh, they're experiencing uh, much uh, larger increases in, in temperatures. And of course, it's this, it's this change in temperature that is driving every, every climate impact uh, that, that is of concern for us, whether that's precipitation or extreme events. Um, and so um, just uh, looking in particular at uh, our Northern communities and what are some of the key impacts uh, that we'll be facing uh, the way we're going to feel that increase in global aver average temperatures is in our warmer winters, uh, not necessarily in, in our warmer summers. Um, and so the, the, the graphs here that you can see are uh, basically breaking down the um, temperature changes uh, by season 
and the one in the upper left is it represents uh, changes in, in, in winter temperatures. We'll also see uh, things like uh, longer growing season, uh, shifting ecosystems, uh, changing hydrology, and and I say changing hydrology here rather than uh, you know uh, predicting or, or projecting specific shifts in levels of precipitation. Uh, does seem increasingly clear that we are going to see an increase in precipitation, but I think that's not even necessarily the most important element. Um, when we think about changing hydrology, because the, the other changes that are going to happen in, in our water systems are just as important. Things like the fact that uh, more of our precipitation would fall, will be falling as rain rather than snow, which means that it won't be captured in the, the beautiful natural reservoir that snow offers us over the winter. Um, and and uh, I, I think that's an important change in um, uh, basically our water holding capacity and, and when water will be available uh, to communities, particularly in, in, in late summer months. And uh, of course, more variability. Uh, and I always uh, uh, try to highlight uh, this theme as well, uh, because I, I think all too often there's, uh, there's a tendency to presume that it's the average changes that matter. Uh, and so a lot of Canadians, of course, get excited about the fact that we're going to have warmer winters. Um, but uh, the problem is, is, is uh, the, more the more variability that we have in our system, the, the less you can expect anything like an average year to, to occur at all. Uh, and then finally, more extremes. And, and we're certainly seeing uh, uh, that in, in the form of uh, droughts and, and wildfires and, and flooding. Uh, and all of those uh, in various ways combine to, to introduce other kinds of um, extreme events like pest infestations and, 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 and things like that. And, and so um, when you think about our own communities, uh, I, 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 I want to hear uh, about each, uh, you know, what you have all been experiencing in your own communities. Um, but rather than tell, tell you what, what, uh, what's going on in your own communities and uh, to tell you what, what uh, you know, how, how to go about adaptation planning in your own communities, I, I wanted to end with just, I, I think, a, a handful of, of my own personal thoughts uh, in terms of, you know, if I was involved in adaptation planning uh, in a Northern Prairie community, uh, these are the kinds of things that, that I would want to, to keep in mind uh, and to keep on the table. Uh, and the first one is forget about trying to eliminate uncertainty. I've, I've heard all too many people and organizations say, well, we don't know which way the, the temperatures are going to go or water supplies are going to go, so we don't want to act. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to get to that point of certainty. So so we need to start adaptation planning now. Uh, even even though we're doing so in you know in very uncertain um, uh, situations, um, and secondly, conduct your own priority assessment. Uh, don't let somebody else tell you what's important uh, and you know the values that are most important to you and that are at risk and, and that and that you know are are worth paying attention to. That's really uh, you know that's your call in in your own community, uh, and in order to do that, you you know. I don't need to tell you this, you need to get your whole community on board uh, in that, not only for, for that priorities assessment, but, but to get them on board uh, so that um, adaptation planning becomes a collective effort and not a top-down effort um, that is less likely to be, to be embraced. Um, and um, fourthly, uh, focus on building community. I think what we need most mostly is not uh, you know, specific um, uh, specific um, uh, adaptation uh, technologies or or projects. What we need most most more than anything else uh, is to build our decision making support, uh, so that there is a process in place uh, for dealing with uh, those uh, you know uh, inclement situations. And then the second one is, is to provide emotion coping support. And this is something, um, and I'm wearing my sociology hat here. I know there aren't a whole lot of engineers who talk about emotion coping when it comes to climate adaptation, but, but I think it's a big hole. Uh, and particularly as we're starting to see more and more extreme events and just how absolutely devastating they can be, um, a big part of recovering and, and, and of those communities um, sort of coming back uh, uh, from, from those events 
um, it, it is, is going to basically be influenced by the degree to which community members can, can, can come together and be able to support each other uh, and, and to uh, provide um, some emotion uh, coping supports. And then last points, and I think this is really getting at uh, you know, some things that, that, that are, are particular to our Northern Prairie communities, they definitely aren't unique to our Northern pra Prairie communities, but we can't ignore these two major elephants. One being industrial development and the fact that the impacts of climate change cannot be uh, you know, conceived of as uh, you know, in isolation from the impacts of industrial development uh, and neither can adaptation planning. And, and, um, and then secondly, the fact that we uh, are living uh, through um, just a, a massive experience or experiment in, in uh, new forms of information exchange that, that really have allowed misinformation to flourish. And that has in turn led to just really fractious politics. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing more, uh, you know, greater levels of, of, of division. Um, division has always been there, but, but the problem is, is, is in the information environment that we're in today is that each of those uh, groups now has their own information, their own reality, uh, and we're not basically even on the same page and, and sharing that reality. And, and so it becomes more important than ever, I think, to really work on uh, rebuilding uh, relationships uh, between, between uh, groups uh, and, and to try to tackle those divisions in those communities because otherwise all, all of the other, you know, the first four bullets here aren't just, just aren't gonna happen. And then one final note, uh, uh, I think um, I like to look throughout history for guidance uh, in, 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 uh, in, in showing us, you know, what, what can uh, and might happen in the future. And if you look through um, adaptation, uh, you know, studies of adaptation in human history, number one, we are adaptive. We're one of the most adaptive species on earth. Um, but the key to our adaptation has, has been cooperation. Uh, and so this is, uh, I, I think that the thing that, that we need to work on building. Uh, cooperation allows for grappling with big problems, but it also allows for learning through, through knowledge sharing. And we foster cooperation um, uh, when we are communicating with one another, that means tackling language barriers. Um, it, it happens when we uh, come to trust one another. Uh, it happens when we have more equitable relationships with each other. Uh, and each of these in turn contribute to having more empathy and, and compassion for each other. And that's where I'm going to end, and I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Speaker, who is I'll let I'll let Beth. For sure. Thank you so much, Deborah, for your presentation. It's so helpful to understand the particular challenges that Northern Prairie communities are facing, sort of in the context of broader concepts about adaptation. Um, and thanks for the uh, ending on a note of empathy and compassion. Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody that if you have questions. Beth, uh, yep. we lost your audio there for okay, a short while. Okay, I'm not while. sure what happened. I unmuted and then it muted itself again. Okay, so yes, thank you so much, Deborah, for your presentation. Um, and just the reminder, in case you didn't hear, to add any questions that you have to the Q&A box. I see there's lots of comments already in the chat. Um, so please just use that Q&A box for your questions. And thank you so much for your comments so far. Um, so next we're going to move into our community case studies. So we're going to hear from two communities on their experiences planning for climate change. First, we're going to hear from Justin Borg. So Justin, I see you've already shared your screen. Thank you. Um, Justin's going to share how the Willow Lake Métis are adapting to the changing climate. Then we're going to move into Trevor Donald's presentation from the town of Churchill, and he's going to be presenting on their climate change adaptation plan. So Justin, you can go ahead. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Beth, and thank you everybody for uh, for having me here today and allowing us the opportunity to uh, share our climate change experiences with you. Uh, it's been uh, 
it's been an interesting journey, I would say, over the past year for our community. Uh, we went through um, a number of different aspects of the learning uh, learning of uh, climate change, I would say, from a, both from our administration perspective as well as uh, learning and, and knowledge sharing within the community. And we kind of got into it when we started um, the grant, uh, the Community Environment Action Grant Program. Uh, we uh, began a grant, uh, a study, I should say, pardon me, uh, around uh, traditional food and medicines uh, for our Métis people. And, and then that kind of spawned into, we, uh, in addition to that, we did a climate change workshop that was also part of that study and that grant and kind of looking at what our traditional foods, medicines, and knowledge base is out there and looking at that through a climate change lens on, on forecasts and outcomes. And, and I'm just gonna share with you a little bit of those outcomes and learnings uh, through the way and kind of where the, our community is currently uh, uh, direct, uh, headed in because of the work that we've done thus far. So the traditional food and medicine studies, we kind of broke it out into four different phases. Uh, I've got them two and three, a little bit grouped in the middle there, but essentially phase one, uh, the assessment research and design was really about getting uh, connected with our community, uh, making sure that we had a base understanding of uh, their knowledge, their experiences on the land. Uh, we did a number of surveys and uh, interviews with our, our setting up for interviews with our, with our members. And, and talking about their actual land usage and, and, and what they're seeing out there. We also partnered with the local school uh, land-based learning program. And we provided, uh, as part of this grant, we provided a program on the top 20 traditional uh, medicines and plants and uh, brought that into the school. Um, and, it, and, and then as later on into the program, we as I'll touch up on here in a bit, but. Uh, uh, we started to kind of bring that climate change lens in uh, towards the end. So it was a really good experience for the youth to, to get an understanding on what those plants were, how to identify them, and then looking at uh, the future uh, forecast with climate change and, and, and trying to get our youth engaged was really the target. Phase two and three education adaption and action planning was uh, really those group interviews that I spoke of uh, documenting our foods and, and medicines, the impacts and the abundance uh, in the area and the distribution, how we used to harvest it, how we do it today. All of those uh, traditional indigenous knowledge pieces, uh, we collected all of that. We did the workshop for the Willow Lake members on climate change awareness and adaption strategies. And then again, the second phase of the school was uh, designing youth action plan on greenhouse gas reduction, foods and medicines and adaption strategies, and really just starting to introduce our uh, high school students to a lot of, uh, a lot of the climate change information and, and direction that things are going. And close things out um, there with sharing with our stakeholders and, uh, and a number of different information gatherings on the outcomes of that study. Well, I'll take us back to uh, the climate change awareness and adaption uh, workshop that we completed. Uh, it was uh, the content and delivery was uh, two half day workshops to try to span out to reach out to all of the community. Um, I guess if I'm to take things back a little bit, I should have introduced Willow Lake specifically. Uh, Willow Lake is uh, a community that is in the hamlet of Anzac, which is a hour and a half outside south of Fort McMurray. Um, and so when I speak of the community, there is two communities within one. There is the Willow Lake Métis Nation, our Indigenous community that lives within the town of Anzac. So these workshops are really geared to get everybody involved, uh, regardless of uh, Indigenous con um, heritage or not. And, uh, and so we really opened it up to the, to the collective town of Anzac. And uh, we provided the community with a real in intimate session on Climate Change 101, essentially is what it was with uh, uh, getting their feet wet really quick on what some of the forecasts were. And uh, so some of the positive outcomes we had, our community's input started to guide our organization's need to explore different adaption strategies. So that, you know, in our, our community spoke and it kind of drives our, our, our initiatives within our organization. It provided us tangible outcomes for educating our community um, and a baseline for developing the uh, top two areas for our community to focus in. 
And then some of the learnings we had was, uh, and kind of the comments to uh, Doc, um, to the previous speaker was, it's hard to decipher for us when we spoke with our community between what is an industry impact and what is a potential climate impact. Um, we take, for example, um, the abundance or lack thereof abundance of blueberries uh, that uh, members have noted. Um, you know, is that a climate change and an evolving thing from climate change or is that an impact because of the industry that uh, we are surrounded by uh, specifically in our region so uh, we share a bit of a double-edged sword uh, in terms of looking at what those impacts are um, and then I guess the last learnings was that within our community itself varying levels of climate change understanding made it hard for us to really dive down into that workshop to get into uh, a local early action plan uh, Coming out of that community's distress, uh, we did end up uh, getting down to an early action uh, action plan, a local early action plan. Um, the community after what we had to do was really take a step back after after the workshop and uh, come out with more education with the community, get them more involved and more understanding around the discussions that we're having and what what potential um, solutions we could look at and and then through a few more uh, intimate sessions with our members uh, we came out with a couple of strategies which we're currently exploring the first one uh, is um, to the Willow Lake Bison project and our intent there is to culturally reconnect our community and the region to the sacred animal that's always been the cornerstone of our rich Métis history um, this ties back to our adaption plan around a local food source um, and as well, um, bringing the cultural connection back to our community. Um, we are in the process of, um, we have uh, explored a number of different opportunities to bring this, uh, this to a reality to our community. Uh, we're currently looking at uh, the land situation is what is kind of impacting us at this point in time. Um, and once we remedy the ability to secure land, to be able to, uh, to raise a herd of bison, our community is uh, fully engaged to bring that to a reality. So um, there's lots of number of different aspects to bring this all together that we're actively working, but it has been set as a as one of the priorities from our community, which we would like to would like to see happen from a, a readiness from a climate change perspective. And then the second is local local power source. And again, with with our community. Um, we are looking at the various various different ways options that we can bring local power into our community um you know whether or not we start small or go straight to a solar farm or go into a wind farm there's there's varying options or or do we start really really small and just look at how do we provide each home with with uh, some complementary power in the event that uh, there is power loss and and is it local local solar on each house or how how does that look? But I guess there's no no defined outcome as to what we're going to explore. But right now we're kind of in that exploratory uh, phase into what is the best option for our community and the best economically, um, and and how do we provide that service for our Métis people? And I that is kind of the overview. Um, I thank you again for given me the opportunity to speak and uh, look forward to any questions at the end. All right, thank you so much, Justin, for your presentation. It really brings home some of those uh, concepts on the ground of adaptation that's happening in your community. Um, so I will turn it over now to our last speaker, Trevor Donalds. And okay, your presentation is looking great there. And Trevor, Trevor if you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. Sure, no problem. <clears throat> so I'm talking to you from Churchill, Manitoba. I put up a map here. Um, it shows the 53rd parallel in Manitoba. That's become a very significant parallel uh, recently um, due to COVID restrictions. So there is a travel restriction on Northern Manitoba. And for reference, Northern Manitoba is made up of about 70% Indigenous population and First Nations communities. A lot of these First Nations communities are flying communities with very little um, health resources. And a lot of them, if there was an emergency, a lot of people would have to be uh, medevaced to Winnipeg. 
So it's become very significant. And then when we're talking about adaptation planning or the pandemic, um, you can see here with the pandemic, there's been social, economic and um, scientific and sustainability concerns. So from blockades to First Nations communities, blocking off their community to preserve their health because of limited resources and infrastructure for medical to um, concerns about can tourism um, go on. Um, and then also research in the North is essentially ceased, even if um, territories or uh, provinces allow travel, universities have essentially said, no, we will not be sending researchers to indigenous communities just because we, you know, we want to, um, you know, stop the spread of, uh, uh, the COVID. And right now in Churchill, we have zero cases as with um, Nunavut as well, except in the mining um, areas. So that's just for some reference there. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 5, um, territory of many uh, First Nations, including the Dene and Cree, and home to many uh, diverse First Nations, including the Inuit and the Metis. So, and I also like to plug um, Sarah. Sarah came up with Winnipeg Free Press. She just started with them a little while ago. She did an amazing job doing a series of stories on Churchill. Um, she was, you know, rep reporters are hit or miss in the North, but, you know, she was like right on the mark, super respectful and covered a wide variety of different stories coming out of Churchill um, and talking about climate change. And I included some links to her work, including um, where she's talking about the adoption of the climate change adaptation plan by council. And so uh, this work is um, funded by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, as you can see here, they took on about 58 coordinators doing adaptation and uh, mitigation. And those are shown there. Sorry. And, you know, uh, FCM provides excellent resources for municipalities considering if they're going to do adaptation or mitigation. Um, and I can link you to some of those resources as well. Um, to, I'll just throw them in the chat for people that, you know, what is adaptation? What is mitigation? We really started at basics when we were doing the adaptation plan of what we wanted to achieve. As you can see, the CO2 emissions have been increasing, and I think both presenters touched on that as well. Um, you know, and there was a five percent decrease due to COVID-19 uh, this year. I heard a lot of comments from people coming to Churchill Academics researchers that made reference to COVID-19 being, you know, good luck for. Um, uh, uh, emissions to decrease. I don't feel the same. I feel a lot of people's livelihoods have suffered as a result. We, when we talk about adaptation, we do not talk about, you know, locking people in their homes. We do not talk about taking away their livelihoods, their jobs. We don't talk about that. I mean, on one hand, you did see a decrease in emissions, but that's just not what we want when we're doing adaptation. Adaptation has happened in various degrees around Churchill, whether it be the Hudson Bay and shipping, Manitoba Hydro, um, transportation like the airport and tourism as well. So it's not so new, but it is quite new. Also First Nations communities around Churchill have took on adaptation programs. Some people may not know, but municipalities and First Nations have access to different types of funding. And if you're there over the 60th parallel in the territories, <clears throat> they also have different access to funding as well. And First Nations communities that use consultants are usually more successful in getting funding. Um, that is a bit concerning, um, especially since this, these funding opportunities should be equal. But you can see, you know, one First Nation community here access about $400,000 in funding for adaptation. So looking at Manitoba in general and the Nunavut territory, Nunavut did two adaptation plans a decade ago. 
one for Arviat, one for Whale Cove. They were done by the Institute of Planners and a bunch of other stakeholders, and they are in excellent plans. They did an excellent consultation. The problem is implementation. Um, Manitoba has a green and climate plan. So that's the provincial plan that touches more on mitigation. And then Winnipeg has the mitigation, Selkirk adaptation, and then East St. Paul a mitigation plan. So, and we're, we have the relatively new adaptation plan. So if people don't know how an adaptation plan becomes, as we say, like policy, it has to go through council. So we did give it the resolution from council to adopt the plan. And, um, you know, we're very um, thoughtful in thinking what we wanted to achieve here with council and council was extremely supportive. So we have that now. How did we get here? As some people may or may not be aware, you have local plans, provincial plans, national plans, and then you have a various um, international frameworks. Um, so, and it's good to be aware of these because it, it shows where we're going. Um, climate change is an international um, issue. So therefore, but we're trying to do it at the community local level. And this is kind of how we initiated by using the milestone frameworks from BARC. Some might be aware of it with ICLEI. Um, you know, and two, you know, there's a lot of visuals out there. If your counselors don't identify with the visuals that are out there or the charts, just change them or fix them or make them into something that they can. So, you know, this is kind of the standard one that everybody sees. I like this with Nunavut, what they did. It kind of speaks to a wider audience. And that's about communication, which is super important when doing this process. So these are kind of the vulnerabilities that we were looking at. And um, you can kind of see them here. This is a diagram by the Arctic Council. So Arctic Council kind of is a larger group, international group that looks at um, climate change in the North and in the Arctic. Um, things like green jobs, uh, food security, um, indigenous knowledge, being able to hunt and fish and have access to on the land resources, um, looking at infrastructure, looking at shipping, looking at permafrost. So these are all the things that we looked at too, um, especially with that COVID lens of building back better and growing back better. Everybody thinks of the cryosphere or kind of your frozen water when they're thinking about climate change in the north. So you can see here, this is the Hudson Bay in June. Um, uh, as you can see, there's trending, it's trending um, ice formation uh, is, is decreasing in the Hudson Bay. And you see it either decreasing the same or increasing in higher areas of the north. And there's a lot of reasons why, and I'm not gonna go into them because <laughs> they're very uh, technical. But you can also think of permafrost as well. So Churchill is on continuous permafrost, and this has impacts on infrastructure like rail um, and even airports as well. So, you know, there are concerns of infrastructure and then communities and buildings in, that commu in those communities. So this is kind of what the adaptation plan hoped to achieve. We wanted to achieve a vision. We wanted to give people an idea of what climate projections are. And we also wanted to um, have some priority areas. So align and integrate within the municipal strategic plan, maintain public health and safety, strengthen buildings and key infrastructure, minimize disruptions to service delivery that the municipality provides, protect biodiversity and natural assets, build resilience and capacity within the region, and demonstrate reconciliation on the, on the ground. That was a term coined by Jim Carr um, during the rail outage uh, when they came to the agreement to form the uh, Arctic Gateway Group. So we kind of took that because that's what we're hoping to do. No more words, let's just do the actions. So taking an example of permafrost in a community, um, Ecology North with the Standards Council of Canada came out with these diagrams. If you actually read the standard, it is extremely technical. You would probably need an engineer. Um, not every community has an engineer. Not every Northern community has a building inspector. Not every Northern community 
has bylaws for building codes. So these are recommendations or suggestions or best practices in the North, and that's a reality. Also, we looked at drainage in the community. So this is a result of a rapid snow melt. You can see the standing water that creates a problem with foundations in the community, roads, things like that. Um, culverts need to be, you know, steamed, stormwater drains, things like that. So um, we looked at our snow clearing policy and we updated it to reflect that, you know, there's a faster spring melt happening and that is increasing standing water. And then we kind of looked at how could we make, you know, best practice building codes. So this is an example here of a building. You can see the foundation is, you know, kind of warped and that's from, it's a poor drainage area, it's a wetland area and um, yeah, and permafrost is an issue there. So recommendations, um, so I'm just firing through this, but uh, in terms of recommendations, uh, so we're looking at two huge infrastructure projects in the north. One is Nunavut's infrastructure gap. And Churchill is in a position to be able to support, you know, updating infrastructure in, in Nunavut. As the population increases, as the economy increases there, we're in a position with the rail that we could support updating infrastructure. As well as the infrastructure bank has uh, signed a memorandum for the Kivalik hydro fiber project. A lot of people don't know, but a lot of Nunavut communities are on diesel. Churchill is very fortunate to have a hydro line to it. And a lot of and Nunavut communities do not have fiber as well, or um, internet connection. So this project would look at running a line up to the territory to provide that. If you think about it, diesel brought in to the territory is about 50 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas in Churchill, we pay about five to eight cents per kilowatt hour. <clears throat> and the big thing I'm going to stress now is leadership. There's a lot of opportunities in the north. Um, you know, as a community, we did the planning, but there needs to be leadership um, happening. And that's huge. As communities in the north shrink, they lose skills, they lose ability to bargain with leaders and politicians and that, that is unfortunate. And we need to retain these communities. We need to ensure that these communities are adapted for a future climate. Um, so, you know, just, and we just need to invest in these Northern communities as well for adaptation. So that's, that is my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Trevor. And to both Trevor and Justin, I think both of these case studies are so intriguing put together and really make for an interesting discussion. Also drawing on Dr. Davidson's presentation at the beginning. Um, so we have about seven minutes left before one o'clock and we're hoping that participants can stay maybe five minutes longer because we do have a lot of really interesting questions happening. Um, and if you're unable to stay, we are recording this and we'll follow up from this webinar today with a link to the recording. So if you have to go, um, please don't feel like you'll be missing something because we'll have that recording up. Um, so again, thank you so much for all the, all the questions that are coming into the Q&As. I think there's some in the chat as well. So we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, but I wanted to start with one question here. Oh, it's now disappear, but we can move on to something else. There's a question here from Jeremy Cadence, uh, who says, I'm curious about local power solutions and to what extent that Northern communities in question view changing the power supply as a priority compared to other adaptation activities. Do the community members feel strongly about building up renewable energy projects? Um, so maybe we can start with Justin, because you had mentioned that as one of your uh, activities moving forward, and if you have any insights on that. Yeah, so um, really, yes, it is getting back to the renewable energy piece and being a little more greener. Uh, specifically, um, our community, as I kind of tried to allude to earlier, is a small community within a larger group within a larger municipality and so we're trying to make what kind of impact can we do 
um, you know, and not have the scalability to be making, you know, put bringing transmission lines in and doing all kinds of these big type projects. Uh, so for a small community's perspective, we're just looking at the little things that we can do to prepare our community for what the future looks like. And, and so that's why the local power is one of the things that we're looking at to be a little bit more greener from our community's perspective. And then if and when a, uh, a disaster happens and or where we lose power for a length of time, our community is protected and still can function. So that's kind of the strategy behind that. All right, and Trevor, did you want to add anything to it from your case? I mean, if you look at Churchill, Churchill has 80% public housing. This public housing is on propane for heating. So, I mean, there is a tremendous opportunity there to, um, you know, move from propane, but we need the redundancy. You just can't move from propane to electricity and then suddenly have your electricity go out in the middle of winter, you know, leaving people with, um, you know, a lot of, you know, they would have to evacuate and that would be a huge concern. Having a microgrid like was suggested, you know, there are examples of microgrids in, in um, Canada, uh, in Northern Ontario, especially where, you know, if the power does go out, then there is a microgrid that can um, power, power, you know, key infrastructure in the community. And I think that's how we should be thinking rather than, you know, it's great to have a transmission line. I would not want to be on diesel. Um, there are communities in Northern Manitoba on diesel and it's, it's not pretty. So, you know, <laughs> and there needs to be a balance there. Great, thank you so much. All right, so I found my first question here. It's, um, and uh, Deborah, you've answered it in the box, but I wanted to return to it because I think it touches on sort of all three presentations about some of the socio-political barriers to adaptation planning. And this question is from Amanda Rooney. So um, she says, uh, what do you see as the most promising avenues for rural municipalities and NGOs to begin addressing the socio-political barriers to starting adaptation planning? So maybe we'll start with Deborah and then move on to draw some lessons from some of the case studies. Uh, sure, uh, first, th thanks for the question, Amanda. Um, that's uh, that's uh, my bad, I often talk about barriers without also talking about ways to address them. So uh, thanks for calling on me on that and particularly on this, this particularly challenging one. I'm, I'm just gonna say, uh, highlight two things. Uh, number one is uh, that, that one of the biggest mistakes that planners, decision makers um, have, have made in the past in all sorts of different uh, circumstances is to presume that the way to get people on side is to quote, quote unquote, educate the public and that, you know, their, their resistance or their lack of engagement is simply uh, due to the fact that, that they don't have information or, or that they're not educated. This rarely has the, the intended effect. Um, and I, I don't mean to suggest that information doesn't matter, um, but uh, that in order to really tackle those cognitive barriers, it's not to tell people how climate change works. It's uh, basically providing space for everybody to express their values and, and concerns and, you know, acknowledging and honoring all of those different perspectives. Uh, and then the second thing that, that I, I mentioned, and in, in this um, uh, comes down to a lot of, uh, you know, um, printed videos, social media communications, and things like that that we use to to try to start up conversations. Um, I, I think it, it it's it's kind of ironic that that we uh, and and those in the scientific community have often assumed that um, you know we we need to uh, present scientific information in in uh, sort of a neutral tone. Uh, make it purely fact-based, and that that will enhance its, it, you know, its, its legitimacy. And there's just been a, a, a host of research on communication in communication studies, which shows the the opposite that that information that evokes emotions is more likely to get get attention first of all uh, than information that's purely fact-based. Uh, but secondly, the kind of attention also matters. Um, so another uh, tactic, particularly amongst uh, climate change advocates is, well, let's, let's scare people. 
uh, let's let's uh, let's invoke fear, uh, and that'll get people on board. Um, and fear might get attention, uh, you know, at first, but people are just as likely uh, to to sort of turn away again after that initial trigger, just because fear is a negative emotion, and we don't like to sit in in, in negative emotions. And so, um, a growing amount of empirical research has been showing that that communications um, that uh, focus on hope. And, uh, and, and efficacy uh, tend to have much better responses and are more likely to you know, get, get people's attention and, and bring them to the table. Excellent, thank you. And Justin or Trevor, did either of you want to comment on some of those sociopolitical barriers? Um, <clears throat> we talked a lot about in the adaptation plan. If you go to the kind of before, like the uh, actual plan itself, we talk about challenges, barriers, everything that Northern communities have, and we lay it out um, transparently. We don't, you know, there, we don't hide anything and say, you know, this is going to be easy, because frankly, it's not. And there are a lot of challenges for Northern communities, especially funding. So, you know, my position is a term position and it'll end at some point. And that adaptation plan is set up that somebody can just go in, copy and paste into a funding application and send it off. And, you know, and it, it might be the CFO, it might be the CAO, we don't know who that's gonna be, but they need to be able to understand the information in the plan as well. So that's why it's good to involve everybody, especially the community all through the process. Yeah, agreed. I'd say um, we went through a lot of that just in our small little community about uh, the varying uh, views on climate change. Uh, we had to look at the information that we were providing to them and kind of disseminate it in a number of different ways because everyone's different at the end of the day and everybody will react to that information quite differently. Um, and so we found uh, our elder community, uh, for example, you know, the facts on that it wasn't scaring them um you know they've they ha had already shared a lot of their 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 traditional knowledge and their learnings about from their experiences through throughout their years of, be, of becoming an elder that they they can see this already so showing them that information didn't scare them it just kind of like yeah you're telling me something i already know whereas the the kind of uh, the work the middle of the age group kind of thing that, that they were really kind of starting to get panicky and then the younger kids the younger kids were were they're not scared of it they're they're resilient so they're ready to kind of jump in and how are we going to fix it kind of thing so we really had a lot of different demographics just within our own small community on how do we how do we kind of bring that education piece forward and how do we kind of make sure everybody's understanding and lockstep as we're going through the process. And I will echo what uh, what Trevor did say about the the funding in the Northern communities. Uh, to be honest with you, if it's if it's not for the, the, the few grants that you might be able to get your fingers on, like from our community's perspective, had we not been able to receive that one grant, we wouldn't be in the place in the situation that we're in right now. We wouldn't have been educated. We wouldn't have a strategy going forward on that. So. Um, it's not like the communities have money to say, let's put this aside for action plan, climate change action planning. It really needs to come from the support services that are out there. Otherwise, um, it, it's hard to make a priority on today, uh, looking for tomorrow when you don't have the funding to do that. When you got priorities to spend that money on today kind of thing is what I'm saying. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for those responses. Um, we did have another question that's sort of related to something that Trevor brought up about political cycles. So I'm just gonna um, state what the question is and give a brief moment if somebody else wanted to respond, but it's from Dwight Mercer. So politicians tend to operate on a three to four year election cycle. How do you intend to sustain momentum as Trevor mentioned with the Churchill's plan uh, over a longer time frame? Um, so Justin, I wonder if you had any insights on that or Deborah, and then um, hopefully we can squeeze in one more question before we finish. Yeah, for me, um, I, I operate very similar to what the, how Trevor uh, explained. Um, we like to do things once. So as we're doing things, we set it up as a process. We don't just, uh, that's the way our organization likes to run right now. So 
Um, and it's very important that as you're doing that, you make sure you maintain that focus that we need to streamline the work and we need to make it so it doesn't matter who's in in the political chair or who's in charge of uh, the operation. The people that uh, execute the work know what they're doing and, it, and there's a way to get to that end goal of, of what you're trying to do. So. I would just very briefly add to that. I, I think that is precisely the reason that you need to get your community invested uh, and that it's not top down because yeah, you're, you're, the top is gonna, is gonna shift uh, and, and that's pretty inevitable. So, so you can't you know, uh, wait for your elected officials to deliver. All right, so um, we do have a couple other questions, but I think we really run out of time today. So thank you to everybody who put questions in. I see there is another question about some regional um, approaches to adaptation and infrastructure planning. Um, and then another question about adaptive capacities, but we're sort of at time today. Um, so I just wanted to thank the panelists for being here today and giving such rich um, presentations on the cases um, but also the broader con concepts around uh, what Northern Prairie communities are dealing with in terms of adaptation. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists today. Um, for everybody else, we have recorded today's webinar, as I mentioned. We're going to be posting it along with the presentations from our panelists. Um, there's going to be a short evaluation survey also at the end of the webinar, and we would so appreciate if you fill it out for us. Uh, and then we'll be sharing that survey in a follow-up email too. So I hope everybody had a chance to connect um, in the chat and thank you again for all your engagement and for joining us today. Um, I'd also just like to make one last announcement uh, that the PRAC Regional Workshop is going to be coming up soon. Uh, we're still ironing out the final details on that, uh, but that is to be determined. Thank you so much to our great community of practice in the PRAC. Thank you. Thank you.